This presentation will be a short life story and deep dive into the mathematician Bernard Riemann. Riemann's full name, as a little fun fact, is George Friedrich Bernard Riemann. I will begin by giving you an overview of his life, and I would like to apologize for any mispronunciations of names throughout this presentation. Riemann was born in September of 1826 in Germany. He was born into a poor Lutheran pastor's family. As a young child, he showed an affinity for math, so his teacher lent him number theory. Riemann claims to have read and memorized the book in the span of a week. Riemann studied mathematics at the University of Göttingen from 1846 to 1847, and again from 1849 to 1851. He did transfer to the University of Berlin for that interim period of 1847 to 1849. After graduating, he worked his way up the career ladder until he became a professor at Göttingen in 1859. While teaching at Göttingen, it became quickly apparent that he was a poor lecturer. It wasn't all his fault, though. He was not the most eloquent writer, and several of his students passed away. They didn't die in his actual classes, at least not that I had found, but they did die while also being students of Riemann. However, his work as a professor did draw the attention of Dedekind and Karl Weistris. Additionally, Felix Klein and David Hilbert were interested in Riemann's work for his intellectual depth and conceptual thinking rather than ingenious calculations. Basically, they liked his theories and ideas more so than other mathematicians' affinity for calculations. Shortly after gaining his professor title, he married Elise Cook. In 1862, Riemann contracted tuberculosis and then decided that it would be a great idea to continue traveling between Germany and Italy for the next four years. That traveling worsened his disease and ultimately caused his death in Italy in July of 1866. Now that you have a better idea of who Riemann is, I'm going to go through some of his work in mathematics. So in 1851, Riemann published his doctoral thesis. In his thesis, he introduced generalizing the study of polynomial equations. He worked with real cases, when equations define curves, and imaginary cases, when equations with two complex variables define a surface over a plane. This surface is now known as the Riemann surface. He also introduced that surfaces can be classified by numbers, which are now called the genus. This number is determined by the maximal number of closed curves that can be drawn on a surface without splitting it into separate surfaces. This idea is expanded upon in his 1857 paper and eventually becomes topology. In his postdoctoral qualification, Riemann argued that the fundamental ingredients for geometry are a space of points and a way of measuring long distances along curves in the space. He stated that this space doesn't have to be normal Euclidean space, which inspired Eugenio, Eugenio Beltrami to work on non-Euclidean geometry. His idea, ideas in this paper also provided the foundation for four-dimensional geometry of space-time that Einstein used in his theory of general relativity. He also worked on a few other concepts in mathematics. He worked with the zeta function in number theory. This function takes the value zero at the negative even integers at points on a certain line. This work led Augustin Louis Cauchy and Riemann to create the Riemann hypothesis. In David Hilbert's 1900 address, The Problem of Mathematics, Hilbert challenged mathematicians to either prove or disprove Riemann's hypothesis and I believe that is still yet to happen. Riemann also studied how functions compare to the trigonometric representations, which led him into studying discontinuous functions. Riemann was one of the first to study differential equa equations involving complex variables, which led to group theory. Lastly, he introduced new methods of partial differential equations and used them to create the first major study of shock waves. Now that you know a little bit more about him as a mathematician, I'm going to walk you through Riemann sums. I know Riemann best for his work on these. So you can see the equation for Riemann sums on the screen. Riemann sums are the summation or addition of the area of rectangles created on curves to estimate the area under that curve. As n approaches infinity, that means the width of the rectangle is getting increasingly smaller. Using bigger values of n in the summation makes a better approximation of the area under the curve. Delta x is the width of those rectangles and is equal to the distance from a to b divided by n. 
In an integral, dx can be thought of as infinitely small, but not zero, widths of those rectangles. So there are three main ways of computing Riemann sums. I'm going to walk you through left, midpoint, and right approximations for the function y equals 1 fourth x squared plus 1, where a is 0, b is 6, and n is 3. Since our n value is 3 and we are starting at x equals 0, we will place a point on the curve at x equals 0, 2, 4, and 6. Left and right endpoints are marked by a, b, c, and d, and midpoints are marked by k, i, and j. Left endpoint approximation does what it sounds like it should. A, B, and C will be the marks for the top of our rectangles, as they are the first three points we come across as we move left to right within our bounds. We are using the first three because our N equals three. So we will draw horizontal lines from the left of those three points and fill in the other sides of the rectangles. Right endpoint approximation also does what it sounds like it should. B, C, and D will be the marks for the top of our rectangles, as they are the first three points we come across as we move right to left within our bounds. We will draw horizontal lines to the right of those points and fill in the other sides of the rectangle. Midpoint is a little bit different from the right and left, but does what it sounds like it should. For the midpoint, we use the midpoint of our delta x's, so we go halfway between the points that we used in the left and right estimations. X, I, and J, or K, I, and J will be at the top of our rectangles. Again, we will draw horizontal lines through our points to create the tops of the rectangles and fill in the other sides. Now for actually computing these values. For left endpoints, this is the official summation formula where we start at I equals zero and go to N minus one for the function. In our case, we will be going from zero to two. The summation is written out in the following where delta x is the width of the rectangles and h sub i is the height for that rectangle. To approximate the left endpoint area, we will find the area of the three rectangles, which is 2, 4, and 10, respectfully, respectively. Our total approximation is 16 units squared for our left endpoints. For right endpoints, you can see that there's a slight difference in the summation formula. We'll be using i equals 1 to n in this case. However, finding the areas is not totally different, or is not different at all, from finding the left from the left endpoint method. Our areas are 4, 10, and 20, respect, respectively, for a total approximation of 34 units squared. Our final method, midpoint, is a bit different from the previous two methods. In this case, we will have to plug in our x values plug our x values into our equation to find the exact y value, since they don't fall on grid point intersections. But finding the area of those rectangles is still the same. Our areas are 2.5, 6.5, and 14.5 respect, respectively. For a total area, of a pro total area approximation of 23.5 units squared. Comparing these three methods, which do you think the best approximation is? We will go through evaluating the integral to determine which was the closest. So here's a quick throwback to Calc 1 for those who don't remember. We'll be using the power rule to find the antiderivative of our function and evaluate it from 0 to 6. So as you can see, I did the power rule on the screen. So we'll have 1 12th x cubed plus x evaluated from 0 to 6. So we'll plug in 6 for x. So we'll have 1 12th times 6 cubed plus 6. And we'll also plug in 0 for x. And we'll have 1 12th times 0 cubed plus 0. And we'll find the difference of those. So when we find the difference, we see that the actual area under the curve is 24 units squared. As we can see, midpoint is the best approximation for the area of y equals 1 4th x squared plus 1. This is generally true for all area approximations. Midpoint will be a better approximation since it's a balance between the overestimation and the underestimation that can happen with left and right approximations. However, if your number of rectangles is small enough, you might not see much of a difference in the three methods. This concludes my presentation on Bernard Riemann and his contributions to mathematics.